Hello again. I'm the last in the uh, PowerPoint marathon. Uh, although I like to think that we at least made our PowerPoint uh, entertaining and Dr. Tatesman had some good examples of uh, training in terms of what not to do um, for documentation. So I'm gonna, in this last 15 minutes, I am gonna talk for 15 minutes, we're a little over, but that is okay, because we have a break built in and we'll just sort of uh, take a little bit of a shorter break and continue on uh, to the law enforcement panel. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two sort of different topics, but they're kind of related. Um, in that first, I'll talk about different ways that OIG requests information from providers, and then I'll talk about how providers can disclose information to the OIG uh, through uh, when you have found a compliance problem in your organization. So first, how OIG requests uh, information. Uh, we contact providers for information for a couple of different ways, and the, what we use depends on the purpose. Either we are engaged in an investigation, an audit, or an evaluation. I'll talk about investigations first. Uh, in an investigation, the OIG will typically issue an OIG subpoena. We may issue and frequently do issue subpoenas to targets of investigations, but we also may need to issue a subpoena to providers who have information relevant to the investigation of someone else. So for example, if we're in, uh, investigating a physician for billing fraud, we may, may need records from other healthcare providers that that physician either referred patients to or treated patients at, such as, or, or ordered services or items from, like DME providers, hospitals, um, uh, radiology, uh, radiology centers, and the like. An IG subpoena orders or compels a person or organization to bring uh, information documents or records uh, to the OIG. Uh, so we're, it's a documentation subpoena. Our, as a, our authority for the subpoena comes from the Inspector General Act. Uh, the Department of Justice also has the ability to issue different kinds of subpoenas, and so those are sometimes also used in a healthcare fraud investigation. If you are ever served with a subpoena, please do not ignore it. Uh, failure to respond is considered failure to comply and we can sue in federal court to enforce a subpoena. The subpoena itself is a packet of paper uh, that has a cover letter in it that provides the contact information for the OIG agent uh, who is assigned to the case. Um, it'll then include uh, information defining the terms and then list what it is that we're looking for. If you have questions, and providers frequently have questions about what it is that we're looking for or what the terms in the subpoena mean, please contact the agent listed in the cover letter um, and they will, and the agent and then will uh, contact the attorney involved in the investigation and we can, we can uh, move forward on uh, answering those questions and getting you to, uh, you know, getting the subpoena process moving forward. Aside from our law enforcement activities, however, OIG does a huge amount of audit and evaluation work, uh, and, 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 or, and we need information from providers to do that work as well. Many audits focus on specific providers. Uh, other audits and our evaluation work focus on looking at some part of the Medicare or Medicaid program more generally uh, to identify potential system vulnerabilities um, and then we will then make recommendations to CMS about how to change the program or improve program integrity features. So I'll talk about our audit work first. Uh, the first step in the audit process is the, the uh, OIG's Office of Audit Services will send a letter to the provider saying that they are the subject of an audit. Um, a short, typically, a short time later, the auditors will hold an entrance conference with the provider uh, to explain what we're auditing and the information that we need. Um, oftentimes, these, or sometimes, these entrance conferences are conducted in person with the auditors. Um, these are opportunities for the provider to explain the information that they have gathered in response to the audit letter 
um, and explain uh, any other issues that you think would be relevant to the audit's work. At the end of the audit, there's typically also an exit conference with the audit team where they explain the findings and there's an additional opportunity to, um, to talk about the audit with them. OIG's Office of Evaluations and Inspections can also notify providers by letter that they have been selected to participate in an evaluation. OEI's work is generally more national in scope, and so there typically is not a meeting with providers on the subject of the evaluation. Uh, they typically will meet more with the program, uh, the, the government uh, individuals involved, or office involved in the program that we're auditing. Um, but needless to say, it is important uh, to respond and cooperate when you have been selected to participate in an audit or an evaluation. Uh, your participation does help OIG fulfill its mission uh, to combat fraud, waste, and abuse in the federal healthcare programs. So now I'll move to the flip side of the situation and talk about where providers uh, disclose information to the OIG in order to resolve liability for problematic conduct. So, and this is a good place to end sort of the compliance part of this uh, presentation because we have talked a lot today about the different fraud and abuse laws and about how to create and maintain an effective compliance program to uh, ensure that you're in compliance with those laws. So really it is a logical last question to decide what to talk about what you should do if you find a compliance problem in your organization. The answer, and we've touched on this a little bit today, is that you should not keep money from a federal healthcare program that you are not entitled to. Uh, as uh, we heard from CMS, they process billions of claims a year uh, and uh, the programs operate largely based on trust. Trust that providers are appropriately providing care and appropriately billing the program for that care. Part of that trust is an obligation to, uh, is an obligation to report and return money that should not have been paid to you. And in this era of new mandatory compliance programs coming in the future and the 60 day overpayment requirement, disclosing and resolving compliance problems to the government has never been more important. OIG has long believed that timely corrective action, including self-disclosure, is a key component of having an effective compliance program. We recognize that disclosing issues to the government is not an easy decision, but it can be more difficult when the government knocks on your door without your invitation. Uh, there is a substantial benefit to taking the step to disclose conduct before we find out about it or before a whistleblower tells us about it. When you disclose a problem in good faith, you are demonstrating that your organization has embraced a culture of compliance and is committed to dealing with the federal health care programs with integrity. In a disclosure, you get to work collaboratively with the government on the resolution of the issue. Now, it may also sound odd to say you get to work collaboratively with the government when you have disclosed potential fraud conduct. Uh, but it can happen and does happen when a provider self-discloses. That provider who self-discloses is in a very different position than one who's under investigation because of a whistleblower or some other lead that we have determined on our own. And finally, uh, keeping federal health care program money uh, overpayments uh, can create additional liability under the False Claims Act and the Civil Money Penalties Law. So, now that you have found a problem, what should you do with it? As an initial matter, it's generally a good idea to get some advice about to confirm that you in fact do have a problem and where to send your problem to. Um, it can be helpful to get advice from uh, a healthcare attorney or an attorney that has experience dealing with the healthcare programs and the government on these issues. Um, if you don't have a lawyer, you can contact your MAC as well to get some advice in part to confirm that you in fact have a billing problem. Issues that are only overpayments or innocent mistakes uh, can be reported to your contractor through that normal 
refund reconciliation process. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that process here today. Uh, OIG has created its own self-disclosure protocol, uh, which I will go into more detail on. Uh, you may also need to report the issue to your local U.S. Attorney's Office, depending on the conduct. And finally, CMS has a disclosure protocol specifically for physician self-referral law or Stark law violations. The bottom line, as an initial matter, is it's a good idea to get some advice and to choose your best disclosure path for your particular situation. Here's how to disclose to the OIG. In 1998, we created the Provider Self-Disclosure Protocol. It sets out a process on how providers can investigate, quantify, and report uh, problematic conduct in their organization. Uh, many providers have, have used the protocol over the last 13 or so years. We've recovered over $270 million in disclosures. Uh, some of the most common issues that come through the protocol include many of the things that we have talked about today. Uh, billing for services provided by an excluded person, uh, upcoding of e &M services or uh, DRG upcoding, uh, duplicate billing, alteration of uh, records that don't support the claim that was filed, and uh, kickback and Stark law violations. Um, on this last point, I will also clarify that the OIG's protocol is appropriate for conduct that implicates both the kickback and the Stark law. Stark law only conduct should go to CMS through CMS's self-disclosure process. Um, the protocol, the OIG's protocol, uh, we helpfully use the same word to describe the protocols, so it can get confusing, but the OIG's protocol is outlined in the Federal Register Notice that is on OIG's website. Um, some of the most common issues and mistakes that providers have made is in your handout, uh, tips for success in the OIG's uh, self-disclosure protocol. I'm gonna highlight four issues. Um, first is carefully think about timing of your disclosure. Uh, oh, we have said, and in our open letters, we have also said that your, uh, in, your internal investigation and damages calculation should either be done when you disclose or we ask that you make a commitment to be done within three months of acceptance. Uh, this is to in help ensure that matters move through the protocol uh, in a timely and efficient way. Um, we have experienced uh, issues in which we receive the letter that says we think we have a problem and we just wanted to let you know and then there's some difficulty in getting the resolution, in getting the matter, the audit done the, uh, the damage is quantified and the resolution done. So we do ask for this commitment up front as part of cooperating with the OIG disclosure process. Uh, second is we ask for a lot of specific information. Uh, the Federal Register Notice goes into great detail about what we're looking for. Uh, the open letter also uh, 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 provides additional detail of what we're interested in. Uh, please provide all of the information we request. Um, we incomplete submissions can delay the process and can result in the matter being removed from the protocol uh, as well. Uh, third is please respond promptly uh, to requests for more information. Uh, we do ask and frankly expect cooperation in the disclosure process as a condition of being in the disclosure process. And fourth, um, uh, I would avoid arguing that no fraud has occurred. Um, the purpose of OIG's protocol is for providers to disclose conduct that they have identified has potential fraud liability. Now, what does that mean? Um, it means that if, no, if, you, if at the end of the day, the provider doesn't believe that fraud has occurred, in other words, they don't believe that the, they have exposure, liability exposure under the fraud laws, then the OIG's protocol is not the place to be. Um, we're here to resolve, to provide a conduct, uh, to resolve conduct that implicates a fraud statute. As I said, overpayments and innocent mistakes should go through the uh, claims reconciliation process. Once we receive a submission, 
It's reviewed by a paralegal in counsel's office. They review it to see if it's complete. Um, if it's not complete, you'll get a letter asking for whatever is missing. Um, we also do a law enforcement check to see if the provider is under investigation by us or another agency. Um, this process can take a period of time, um, and so uh, depending on the complexity of the disclosure and the responsiveness of everyone involved. After the matter has been accepted, OIG staff will review the matter and determine how to work with the provider to verify the information and reach a resolution. Because the plan for all disclosures is to end in a settlement agreement. Uh, sometimes, as part, once OIG has verified the information, uh, we coordinate with the Department of Justice on the matter. Sometimes DOJ requests to be involved and the matter turns into a False Claims Act settlement. Uh, other times, the, that does not happen and the OIG enters into a civil money penalty law settlement with the provider. Uh, in, in recognition of coming forward and disclosing conduct, providers are generally permitted to pay a lower settlement amount than providers who have not self-disclosed, who are subject of affirmative investigations. Another incentive to disclose is that the OIG has said that we would presumably not require a corporate integrity agreement in order to resolve a disclosure, um, so long as the provider has fully cooperated in the disclosure process. Um, as I said earlier, disclosing a problem and working collaboratively with the government to resolve it shows that your compliance program has been fully incorporated into your organization. The saying, actions speak louder than words, rings especially true in this situation. That's why we believe we've provided two valuable incentives, both a lower settlement amount as well as a presumption of no CIA in order to recognize providers that have done the right thing um, and fully embraced a culture of compliance. So that is the end of my section and the end of the second session of today. Uh, we will take a break. Uh, the speakers will be around for questions and we will reconvene at, we're gonna take a five minute break and we'll reconvene at 11.50. 11.50, okay, thank you.